about her tell me Andrew Donaldson thrilled to be with you and I get to talk about y'all knows that my absolute favorite subject in the world West Virginia uh journalist John W Miller he has a great little documentary on Moundsville West Virginia morning sir appreciate you joining us thank you very much for the time good morning to you great to be here um you have a journalism background how does a nice uh Wall Street Journal level journalist wind up making a documentary about Moundsville West Virginia so I moved to Pittsburgh in uh, 2011 and, you know, Western Pennsylvania and West Virginia, you know, they call Pittsburgh the, the capital of West Virginia. And I think that's that's almost accurate. Uh, and the whole region is, is full of these towns that used to have these glorious, glamorous factories and very prosperous communities. And then the 2016 election happened. Everybody was talking about these towns, but they weren't talking about the people in the towns. They were talking about, you know, who, basically who they voted for. National politics became this obsession and Trump became an obsession and I thought, what if you went and spent time in one of these towns and only talked about the people and their work and, and didn't like get distracted by national politics and created relationships with them and, and conversations with them? And so I started going to Moundsville, which I, I saw as a very archetypical town. It had the world's biggest toy factory. They made rock and sock and robots there. It had a Native American burial mound that was 2000 years old. And now it has, you know, a Walmart and a hospital, just very, very classic American town. And I just got very into, interested in it. And I met a filmmaker and said, hey, why don't we make a movie? And we got $4,000 from Pittsburgh Arts Council and spent a year shooting it and premiered in the town itself with the people you know, from the town watching. Uh, and that was it. And then PBS picked it up. And it's been a very in interesting, stimulating ride because it's so it's a universal story. It's universal. But one of the things that make it universal is there's some really deep roots here. Uh, the burial mound is far back beyond recorded human history for all practical purposes. They don't even know the actual name of those people that built it. They've assigned a name to them. Uh, Meriwether Lewis has a journal entry about Moundsville that he wrote about the mound and of Lewis and Clark fame. These are deep, deep roots in this town. Um, how does that play when you go to dig into it? Because not just because you're you know from the area anyway, but when you've got deep roots like that and you're trying to tell a modern tale on it, how does that play into it? So just to set the scene, I mean, the mound is right in the middle of town. This is not just some tourist attraction out of the way. It sits, you know, basically on Main Street. It, it hovers over the town. It's an incredible thing to see on the river. And, and you know, very, very famous visitors. Charles Dickens has also been to see it. Um, and so it's in, it's in everybody's consciousness. And for me, what it does is that it reminds you that, uh, you know, civilizations ebb and flow, time goes forward. And what I wanted to do, too, with this documentary is, acknowledge the real grief people have for the 50s and 60s, you know, times when there were more jobs and times where th things were better, but also say, you know, time moves forward. And the mound is an ever-present reminder of that. You know, the, the Adena people that, as you point out, the, um, you know, civilization is, is unclear. Uh, you know, they, they had their time and, and it's gone now. And, and, and you can't get around that. Time moves forward. And the mound is, a, I think, a very healthy reminder of that kind of like a Greek chorus, you know, singing that, that tune throughout the movie. And, we have amazing stories. You know, they had a bar on top of the mound at one point. There was a fight of whether it was appropriate or not to have a Christmas tree. I mean, these, it, it, the mound's kind of like a character, I think. Um, and, and it's alive in that way. And one interesting thing was something that's such a known worldwide tourist attraction, though, is how do the locals see it, though? Because obviously you, you talked about Charles Dickens saw it, Meriwether Lewis saw it. Anybody that goes there has to see it. What What is their perception of it, though? Is it part of their identity or is it just something they feel like they have to live with like some other tourist destinations? That's a good question. It, it is part of their identity and, and they're proud of it. They, um, you know, tourism is how these towns are one, one of the ways these towns survive now. And so not only, I mean, it's a, have a, it has an economic benefit, but also, I mean, they all went to the, see the mound in school. They all know about the Adena people. You know, they're, 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 they're way more schooled in the history of Native America that, than most people in small towns. Yeah. And then if you're my age and grew up in West Virginia, Moundsville was something that you got told about constantly because the threat was we're going to send you to Moundsville <laughs> if you don't sit down and shut up and behave because the other thing, and when you're, you know, you talk about the two things that loom over the town from the mound, you're looking right at it, that giant wall 
uh, the penitentiary that dominated that town for uh, what better part of almost 120 years. So did I say that it was archetypical? I mean, this has uh, one of the most famous uh, tales of, of incarceration. And that's another thing that is very distinctive about America is we, we lock up a lot of people. And, and this, this prison was super famous. And the, it was in movies like um, Night of the Hunter and, and Fool's Parade. Uh, it was, and it closed in 95, by the way. Um, it was seen as, as, as inhumane. And, and it is. I mean, the, the cells are the size of bathrooms. Um, it was where the last recorded hanging was. There's an electric chair people go see. It's also a big tourist attraction and a huge draw for people who investigate the paranormal. So uh, ghost tourism, as, as they put it. And I, I found that fascinating, too. What is it with a town when you have, I mean, they're almost like dual pillars because they stand right pretty close to each other. You have the mound, you have the penitentiary. But this is really a kind of a typical American town story because what does a town that is built on industry, and you can talk about the industry of the Ohio River Valley up through there, when the industry goes away, what we're really dealing with here is a people trying to reckon with who their town is because what it was built around is no longer there, but the people remain. Well, a lot of them leave. I mean, a lot of the people who are more ambitious and have you know more advanced degrees and can make more money if they go to Pittsburgh or New York, they leave. So these towns have had depopulation. And I think that's a really important fact to reckon with, that you've had depopulation, the towns are, are aging. And again, this is just reality. So it doesn't do any good to pretend that you have a bunch of healthy young workers who can just fill a factory jobs if you build a factory, because it's not true. So these towns have to struggle. And my, part of my point, too, is that it's not hell. Like, there's still income. There's still some work. I mean, working at Walmart is not as good as working at the factory, but it's still a job. And, and you can carve out a good life for yourself if you work hard. And, and, and you know, the, there's sort of that, that nuance there that, like, some people have very fulfilling lives in places like this, and they're happy. And they're, and they're not, like, you know, wallowing in, in misery on, and, and on opioids. Like, most people are, in Appalachia are not hooked on opioids. And so I know that story is important, too, and, and, and the, the, you know, opioid story and the drugs and, and all that stuff's important, too, but it's not the only story. And so I wanted to tell basically the rest of the story about what people are actually doing. So in our movie, we have, for example, a factory that makes kitchen cabinets and that, that employs 15 people. Okay. It's not a huge factory, but it's still, it's still an, a thriving business that sells kitchen cabinets for people all over Appalachia. It employs a lot of robots as manufacturers do now. And there's a lot of companies like this scattered throughout the region. And I, I think they deserve, you know, their sort of place in the economic story too. It's not just the Walmart. It's not just the hospital. There are businesses, but it, it also is the Walmart and also is the hospital. And those places, I mean, they have their own challenges. Like they don't, pay enough, frankly. And so that's important to say too. Yeah. We're talking to John W. Miller. He has a wonderful documentary, uh, Moundsville. You can find it at moundsville.org. It also stream on PBS and your local PBS stations. Talk about that real quick though, because you really focus on the people. There's a million ways to make a documentary. Documentary filmmaking is having a real renaissance right now. There's a million ways to do it. You know, we all grew up with, you know, the Ken Burns, the zoom and pan kind of stuff. You, you kept this simple. There was a lot of just straight to camera, the people talking. And I find that although it's a simple method, it's, it's a very powerful method because it's just them telling their own stories in their own worlds, and you have to pay attention to it. And also, there's no outside experts in the film. Everybody in the film lived in Moundsville. Um, only two people didn't. One is somebody who left, uh, Tracy, the drummer. And then uh, Mark Harshman is the West Virginia Poet Laureate. He lives nearby in Wheeling. He lived in Moundsville for a long time, though. So you, know, you could say it's a talking head documentary, but I think it's richer than that because, like you said, uh, it's everybody from everybody in the movie is from the town. And anytime we make like a bigger point, like a point about society or capitalism, it's always somebody who's just uh, an ordinary person making a shrewd observation based on their lived experience. It's not, um, you know, not, not to the, dismiss academics, but it's not like somebody in the ivory tower looking from afar saying, well, this happened. No, these people live, they live through losing their, their jobs. They live through factories closing. They live through these big forces we talk about, like capitalism and global trade. Like they saw its impact uh, in their own lives. Yeah. And I find it very effective. We're talking Moundsville. We're talking about the Moundsville documentary with John W. Miller on Herd Tell. And we'll continue this conversation right after this.
Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Appreciate you staying with us. We're talking to John W. Miller. Uh, we're talking about Moundsville, West Virginia, and a wonderful documentary about a town that's like a lot of other towns. Uh, after the industrial goes away, uh, what do we make of ourselves? Identity. There was some real identity touch points to Moundsville in the documentary. You mentioned it earlier, but I don't know that people understand the toy factory angle of that. Now, if you just say rock'em, sock'em robots, everybody knows what that is. But I don't think they realized that there was a toy industry in this kind of a small town. There were a bunch of toy factories around the area. I think one in Erie, too. And also the Ohio River. I mean, you think about the Ohio River, you think, oh, it's coal, it's steel. But no, the Ohio River was like, you know, China in the now in the 1950s, the Ohio River made everything. You can, you can make cigars, clothes, shoes, toys. The whole supply chain was based around the Ohio River and it made stuff for the whole the whole world. And um, so Mark's toy plant was there for about 50 years. Uh, and the two big products, they, they're very famous, are, are the Big Wheel, the little toy that a scooter kids for kids, and then Rock'em Sock'em Robots. And it, it closed around 1980, uh, in part from because of competition from Asia, but also because kids started playing video games. And so there is an example of, you know, the creative destruction of capitalism. No, nothing wrong with video games and nothing wrong with, you know, consumers making other choices. But it does mean that you don't need those toys anymore. And so it closed. Uh, and that's a, over a thousand jobs were lost. Um, and not just uh, people in factories, but designers and artists. And so you talk about like the, the brain drain and, and, and depopulation. You know, what's been lost is also a lot of creative capital and people who paid for local theater, people who paid to go to concerts. So then this whole economy of, of, of creativity and art uh, was impoverished when, when, when a place like Mark's Toys closed. And, and that's a big deal, too. Yeah. And you mentioned it a minute ago, talking about the cabinet factory. It doesn't sound like you mentioned it. 15 jobs doesn't sound like a lot of jobs. But when you're in a smaller town of, you know, eight, nine thousand people, whatever Moundsville is down to now, that's 15 families, 15 families in a community like that. That's that's a wider radius than you think it is. Is, is some of it just kind of retooling and going like, yeah, a small business of 10 or 15 people doesn't sound like a lot. But you start getting three or four of those things. You really do have a base of industry and a base of support for a town and a community again. It's true because they'll, they'll have suppliers and then, you know, a lot of it's robots now, automation. And so, again, that's that's nobody's fault. That's just the way, you know, technology and progress go. So um, they will have higher profits uh, per person and make more money and uh, buy from local suppliers. So you're right. No, there there is a, a, a network effect of, of companies like that. Yeah. And there's also, uh, you mentioned the tourism before you briefly mentioned the paranormal tourism. Seems like one of those things where a community has a little bit of a love-hate relationship with it, because I'm sure they're happy for the dollars. They're happy for people. I, I love the gentleman that was just driving around town, just pointing out restaurants and things like this. I, I He tickled me to death. But that's sort of a kind of the modern push-pull on some of this stuff. It's like, yeah, we need the money, but do we really want to be known as the ghost place? And do we really want to be known as the penitentiary town and this sort of thing, isn't it? I'm sure there, are, yeah, there are people who are, are, are skeptical, but uh, and you can't beat the, um, you know, the revenue from from tourism because it it requires you know minimal capital investment, and then you can get you, you stimulate the economy in a lot of ways. Um, restaurants, uh, stores, all benefit from tourism. I think it's three million dollars a year now. The impact of tourism on Moundsville. And by the way, the first thing that really caught my eye when I went there was I saw a sign that said "Paranormal Hot Dog Stand." And I thought, what is this? And I went in there and I met Steve Hummel and Steve, he had wanted to be a Navy SEAL. That hadn't worked out. He had opened a gym. That hadn't worked out. He'd opened a hot dog stand. That wasn't working out. And so then he put some ghost stuff in there and called it a paranormal hot dog stand. And that was working. And so I thought, wow, this guy is such a hustler. And he, he's so you know courageous and he wants to stay in his town. He's not giving up. And it might look crazy to you, but he's doing what he has to do to, to you know feed himself and, and, and feed his family. And I really admired that. I thought, wow, in the old days, that guy had a factory job. He didn't have to hustle. Well, look at him now. Like, he has to be so creative and, and, and so, you know, have so much, um, you know, energy. And, and, and he's writing, that guy's writing books and writing, doing art now. I mean, that kind of hustle, I think, is also the story now in, in, in towns like that. And, and those people are not often talked about. Yeah. And kind of semi-related to that, there was several people, uh, younger people in this documentary who talked about another issue that is really big all over. Uh, they talked about higher education or the lack thereof. We had the tour guide at the penitentiary where you just flat out asked him, like, what's your education level? And he explained it. And, and I thought his answer was really, really interesting and kind of telling in a lot of ways. 
So what he said was, um, I had a choice between going to college and getting a house. And I, I chose to get a house because a college degree doesn't always get you a great job around here. I found that so telling because we, we use buzzwords like community and home and career. But man, that just that really hit me as real as like, he's more worried about having somewhere to live and then I'll figure out the living later. That's kind of backwards to how a lot of the rest of society is. And I thought it was a very interesting viewpoint and a neat little window into how some of those folks think, though, isn't it? And also, you know, college in America is too expensive now. The, the price has, has been way inflated. And, you know, sort of in, in intellectuals are afraid to say that, but it's true. And that, like, it's not worth it for a lot of people. And, you know, things need to change. And the, and the way change starts is you, you start by telling the truth. And so for that guy, college is too expensive. And I totally agree with him. Uh, talking to John W. Miller, the wonderful uh, documentary Moundsville. You can find it on PBS, also moundsville.org. Please seek it out. Uh you made it, so you tell me who who's one or two of the people that you met, uh, either on camera or off, that's just kind of stuck with you now that you've had a little distance from making the film. Yeah, so if I had to do it again, I'd include a little more about Gene Saunders. So Gene is the only African American mayor in the history of Moundsville. He's such a, a just a lovely, like high energy guy. Gene worked in the coal mines for a long time, which is uh, um, to my regret not in the movie. He lost a leg in the coal mines. Uh, he had to battle. You know, segregation in, in, the, in the 50s. And he just loves the town. And he's sort of one of these people who, you know, not everybody gets along with him. He doesn't get along with everybody. And that's OK. Like he, he is just a very like you know, patriotic guy, loves America, loves you know, freedom of speech. I just he's a very, very you know, uh, inspiring guy is, is one. And then Steve, who has the, the ghost you know, fat, uh, tourism stuff like life didn't turn out the way that guy wanted. He wanted to be a Navy SEAL and he had all these dreams and, and they didn't work, but he didn't give up. And so I, I really admire that. Yeah, I do, too. All right. I've been praising the documentary. I got to take you to task for one minor item in it. Uh, you call yourself a banjo guy. And yet nowhere in this documentary, I get accordions, I get tin whistles, I get toy pianos. Where's the, ba did, were you just afraid of the stereotype? Were you scared of it? Did you have a hand injury? What happened here? How'd you do a West Virginia documentary without a banjo? <laughs> well, it, in the end, it, it did seem too cliche and we wanted to be a little different. Uh, the truth is also my partner, Dave Bernabo, the, my filmmaking partner, uh, is a very sort of alternative creative type shall we say, who loves doing things a bit weird. And so he had, I think he bought like, you know, Tin Whistle from the 50s. And he got like, you know, he bought all this very esoteric stuff to put the soundtrack together. And he's a musician. Like, you know, he did stuff like he would play a tune and then play it backwards and like use an old, an old, um, uh, I forget what else is what else is in the, well, I think he, he bought like a, a old record and then played it backwards and then the Tin Whistle. Um, yeah, so the, the soundtrack is definitely alternative. I mean, probably is because we couldn't afford to, hire real musicians too um but and he often i think i offered to play the banjo and, and was not was not hired by my own uh music director <laughs> but it it works because it does kind of throw you off at first like well, that's kind of an interesting soundtrack but then when you get to one of the pivot points in the film when they start talking about the toy factory and you see the old mechanical press 10 toys and then you hear that toy piano and the like it all clicks and it's very wonderfully done. So I'm, I'm saying that in jest. It, the banjo probably wouldn't have worked right there, but maybe the next film. Uh, John W. Miller, it's a wonderful film. Let people know where they can find it and where they can follow you and what other projects you have going right now. So the film's available on PBS, uh, PBS app on the Roku or PBS.org. Uh, Moundsville.org uh, has a longer cut that you can rent for four bucks and also has a lot of information, essays and explanations about the film. Um, I'm working on another film about... Uh, uh, middle-class families in Milwaukee in the American dream, which is why I'm wearing a Bucks hat. Uh, that's, <laughs> and so that that's in production. And then uh, my Twitter handle is at JWM journalist. And I, I write for America magazine. So I, I've been doing this column this year called the moral economy about trying to make a more uh, just and moral economy. And then I, you know, I, I write for magazines and freelance um, and write stuff for moundsville.org too, which uh, this year will have over a hundred thousand views to my surprise. So I've kept that. I started to promote the film, but it's turned into the, its own little independent magazine. So that's the beauty too of, you know, self-publishing now. You can do it basically with, with no cost. I don't make any money off moundsville.org, but um, I love doing it. I love the conversations. I love being part of this, you know, trying to think a little more, you know, humanely and, and, and intelligently ab about Appalachia.
Yeah, I love it. I appreciate the voice because as, as somebody who's a very proud West Virginia doing more national kind of media, I, I always have it in the back of my mind that you got to kind of represent. So I appreciate it greatly. It's a great film. I hope people check it out and I look forward to what you're doing in the future. John W. Miller, it's great stuff. Thank you very much for the time today, sir. I appreciate you. So great to be here. Have, have a happy new year. Yeah, happy new year to you, my friend. Thank you very much. Summer concerts, pool parties, chill nights under the stars. We're stocking up our closet so you're ready to look your best for all of it. At Plato's Closet in West Ashley and North Charleston, we're buying all things summer. So bring in your tees, tote bags, sandals, sunglasses, and more. We pay cash on the spot for gently loved name brand looks. Plato's Closet is the go-to destination for trend-forward teens and young adults who support local and shop sustainable. Visit Plato's Closet today. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue.